Sicily has everything. Ancient history, modern history, uh, art, museums, all over the thing. So, and, you know, and the first thing that Garibaldi did when he invaded Sicily and came, took control of Palermo, do you know what it was? And what? not only by Sicilians, all, all, everybody in Italy who wrote poetry wrote it in something that was Sicilian. This is Professor not- Emeritus Gaetano Cipolla is on this week's show. We talk about a wide, varied number of subjects, including the origins of the Sicilian language, the unification of Italy, and the impact on Sicily. Sicilian poetry, bridge or no bridge. You're going to love this show. Enjoy. I'm so excited to discuss a few things about Sicily with you. Welcome back to our show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see you. Before we get to some juicy questions about Sicily, I want to ask you about uh, Francavilla di Sicilia, which is where you were born yes. uh, on on Mount Etna. Uh, talk to us a little bit about growing up. A lot of people don't know that you were actually born in Sicily and came to the United States later. So let's talk oh. first about growing up um, in Francavilla di Sicilia. What are some of your memories? Oh, well, it was a very happy time for me. Uh, I was I, I was born there. I lived there until 1955 uh, when I came to the United States, and I was basically about 17 and a half uh, when, I, when we decided to actually move to the States. My parents uh, had decided to come before, and I joined them uh, after finishing the Magistrale uh, School in from Catania, where I actually uh, spent four years uh, at a pensione. I would go there during uh, school time and then go back home uh, to Francavilla uh, on holidays and in the summer, obviously. So I was... Uh, 17 and a half when I got the, the, the diploma of uh, maestro elementare, ele- ele- elementary school teacher. And uh, wow. I came to the United States uh, in 1955 uh, and basically uh, started a new life uh, in Brooklyn. I've been wanting to ask you this question. When you first find out in Sicily, that you were going to move to the United States of America. What was your reaction? Well, it was it was basically uh, we were very happy because in Sicily things were not. Uh, there was we had some difficulties. Uh, I was very happy to actually begin a new life um, in in America. Uh, I always had uh, this great uh, feeling for America, especially after the war. And uh, it was like uh, the beginning of a new life for me. You were excited. I was very excited, very excited, so then- very happy. And I was determined to become a success in America. You're a stranger in a strange land. You don't speak the language, but as you said, you were very determined. And so it must have been a little bit scary. No, no, it wasn't scary. It was a new experience. I, um, I actually delve into it with a passion. I used to, as I said, I didn't speak English because I had learned French. And when I got to, when I got to America, I only knew two words in English, the word for water and how do you do. Those were the only (laughs) things that, (laughs) how do you do? And we had uh, family here. We had uh, cousins and aunts who had come with my grandparents before me, before us. So they they were Americans, basically. And I met my young cousins who were five years old and eight years old. And all I could say to them was, how do you do? (laughs) And they looked at me as though I were a Martian. (laughs) <laughs> but and they, a lot of people ask me all the time about, and they say to me, Professor Guy, uh, Chipola, they say to me, 
oh, the Sicilian dialect. And I find myself always correcting people saying, no, it's not a dialect. Sicilian is a language. In fact, in Italy, when it was decided that Italian was going to be the main language, there were more people speaking Sicilian. Only a few, maybe less than 10% spoke Italian in the entire boot. And so I want to dive in a little bit further into the Sicilian language. Of course, it's evolved, as you know. Uh, it has the influences of Arabic and all types of influences. Talk a little bit more. Let's dive into the Sicilian language. You know, the whole idea of Arba Sicula. Arba Sicula was founded on the uh, conviction that Sicilian was a language and not a dialect. Because uh, most people, when, when they talk about a dialect, they think that, that a dialect is a corruption of another language. Uh, and uh, my question is, what language uh, would, would be the, co uh, the corrupted language that Sicilian is? It's certainly not a corruption of Italian. It is not it a, a not a corruption of the only way it could be a dialect of Latin because Sicilian was born out of Latin. The La it was the first language to come out of Latin, first, correct? It was the first language used for poetic purposes in Italy, and not only by Sicilians. All, all everybody in Italy who wrote poetry wrote it in something that was Sicilian. This is not me saying, this is Dante who says that, who says basically that for the first 150 years, whatever poetry was written in Sicily was written in Sicilian. This is Dante saying it. So basically, uh, Sicilian was written by people who were not Sicilian. Uh, and we have found, for example, original poems written in Sicilian, uh, in places where you don't expect uh, to find it, in the north, in the north of Italy. So at the court of Frederick II, people were or came from different parts of Italy, and they all, if they, be, if they were poets, they all wrote in a language that was the language used at court. And so Sicilian was the first language ever used for poetic purposes. And it... it went on it hasn't it didn't people didn't stop writing in sicilian uh or speaking in sicilian until recently uh for the first 700 years of uh, of people speaking uh, a language in sicily it was always sicilian until maybe 50 years ago everybody in sicily spoke maybe 70 years ago 70 years ago Everybody in Sicily spoke Sicilian, educated, uneducated, farmers, whatever. There was no difference. Um, and because of the fact that illiteracy was a problem, a big problem in Sicily, as it was all, all over Italy at one point. You mentioned before that 10% uh, of the Italian people in 1860 spoke or understood Tuscan. I think you're being very generous. It's probably less than that. Yeah. Probably less than that. Some people say 5%. Others are, say maybe 3% of the population understood Tuscan. They they could read. If, if, they, if you think that in Sicily and in parts of the South, for example, illiteracy was something like 90%. 90% of the people in Sicily, in Calabria, and in the south, could not read or write. So how would they know Tuscan if they could not read or write? Yeah. They either were Tuscan, which obviously, uh, which was, you know, the language of Dante, Petrarca, Boccaccio, they wrote in Florentine. So if they could not read, uh, how would they know the Divine Comedy? Yeah. Only by hearsay. Only by hearsay or if they or they could memorize things. Uh, one interesting thing about this is that, for example, uh, Sicilians think, many Sicilians actually think that Sicilian is an oral language, that you cannot write Sicilian. The reason for that is 
that Sicilians, I mean, the very few people who actually know how to knew how to read and write, uh, the poets, they knew Sicilian and they knew how how to do it. But the general population learned Sicilian sometimes by speaking. And I'll give you one one little thing about that. The, the church, in teaching catechism to the parishioners, had a book, had books written in Italian for them and in Sicilian for the parishioners. So that basically Sicilians learned Sicilian by wrote by hearing by memorizing so they the priests would give him the prayers they would repeat those prayers they memorize them and never saw the written word never saw the written word uh, and so even my mother who was a perfect speaker of Sicilian whenever I handed her a copy of Arbasicula and she would read the Sicilian she would first mouth verbalize to try to verbalize the the word by itself by splitting it into syllables and then when, when she knew what the word was she said it perfectly yeah. speaking why because she is not accustomed to seeing sicilian written and albacicola must be credited mm -hmm. for actually promoting the writing of sicilian language and i can tell you that basically the if they had done, if the, if the priests had done basically what the Jew, Jewish people of Sicily did, uh, then we would have had uh, uh, a better result because the Jews in Sicily taught their their, their members uh, how to read and write so that they could talk uh, Hebrew. They could read Hebrew. Yeah. They could learn Hebrew. And Sicily, and the Jews in Sicily actually started writing in Sicilian. Wow. Which was, which was uh, a very important thing that sort of coalesced the whole idea of, of writing in Sicilian. So the Jews must be credited for that. And let me ask you about the Sicilian language because you and I both know that after the unification, Italian, Tuscan, which turned Italian, uh, became the official language. That is the official language of Italy. So people always ask me, well, do I need to learn Sicilian when I go to uh, Sicily? No, 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 just learn a few words in Italian because that's the official language of government, of papers, of of commerce, of business, etc. I do know that it is encouraged to teach Sicilian in some schools in Sicily, but you know, our friends, they speak Sicilian to their kids, they speak Sicilian to friends, but it's not something that is kept alive as it was before the unification. I do know that a lot of Sicilians, when they emigrated to other countries, like Alfred's grandparents, they only spoke Sicilian in the house. Right. And so talk to us a little bit about what you see the future of the Sicilian language. You know, the uh, the conference that was held at uh, the European Parliament by uh, the uh, Euro deputy, uh, Ignazio Corrao, uh, which basically uh, brought 150 people from Sicily uh, by, by a charter flight to Brussels, uh, was on, on the idea of actually uh, facing the problem that Sicilian is facing, that is uh, the threat, not the threat of extinction, I don't think it will happen, but it, Sicilian is being used less and less. And the idea was to kind of revitalize uh, the use of Sicilian um, and in, into other things. And because as you said, Sicilians don't use the language with strangers. Uh, they are not uh, if they go to a bank, unless they know the clerk, they will speak to them in Italian. And so Sicilian has been sort of relegated to the realm of the family, which is basically wrong. Uh, most people in Sicily have a, a kind of a um, very difficult uh, relationship with Sicilian. 
many parents, many Sicilian parents discourage their children from speaking Sicilian because they think that somehow uh, learning Sicilian would in interfere with their learning Engli English or Italian. Uh, and that is absolutely wrong. That is that is a, the wrong way to do it because Sicilian, if you learn two languages or three languages or four languages, your brain becomes yeah. even better trained to analyze things. You you build networks in your brain. It, it has been shown basically that learning a different different languages or the ability to speak in in more than one language is. Uh, an experience that enlarges your your perception of the world. The I network. absolutely know, understand as a well, multilingual. You, you, I speak being, several being languages. Hungarian, you already speak three languages. Uh, speak, I'm sure you're learning some Sicilian while you're in Sicily, right? Italian. <laughs> I can Italian. say the basics, Professor. I can say bedu beda. Uh, Amunini, all the basics. <laughs> I, I want to say something very interesting that I've noticed in the past few years, and I don't know if you have noticed that going back into Sicily. I found that using Sicilian has been have become a really cool thing in restaurants, names of businesses. Uh, in fact, a lot of restaurants I see, uh, you know, cum zato. A lot of old Sicilian foods are coming back. Um, Right. Even on YouTube, on Instagram, you know, some of these oh, yeah. reels, they're speaking Sicilian and and actually writing stuff on on the video. So I found that the newer generation sort of thinking of Sicilian as being the new cool. Well, that, is that, that something you've observed? Very happy to hear that. Very happy to hear that because basically uh, there, there's two schools of thought on, on the idea of, of Sicilian. Uh, the conference in, in, at the European Parliament basically was to revitalize it and to uh, actually launch it as a vehicle <clears throat> for expression in every facet of uh, culture. That is, um, Sicilians don't use Sicilian when they go to the bank or when they go to to uh, yeah. deal with the government. And basically what uh, what needs to be done is basically to change the attitude of the Sicilian people uh, to regard Sicilian as an important instrument of identity. And how do you do that? That's very difficult. It's very difficult because people already have been indoctrinated to think that Sicilian is a corruption of, of Italian. They think that is a, an inferior form of uh, expression. It doesn't. They don't know that Sicilian has a vast literature uh, that I have translated. I have translated dozens of poets. We have. I founded a a, a series of books called Poeti d'Arba Sicula, which. Uh, highlights in bilingual form Sicilian and English uh, the major poets of Sicily from the beginning to today modern and past and we have already published 17 volumes 17 wow. volumes of course Matthew. I'm going to leave a link to your website and all your books and everything I want to ask you uh, because it, to me it's so fascinating when you think about you know the Sicilian school that was started in Sicily the sonnet that we know about is starting in Sicily. The first poems were written in Sicilian, and that those were pretty much lost. And you are starting to revive them. You know that is a very uh, notable, notable feat. Talk a little bit about Sicilian poetry, uh, the school of uh, Sicilian um, school uh, started by Frederick, and what happened to those poems. Well, uh, it is it is something that actually interests me uh, very much, uh, and I am uh, I'm basically I have I've done some work on that uh, because, uh, as you know, uh, when Frederick II uh, died in 1250, all the poetry that was written by the Sicilian school uh, was lost, all of it, all of the original poems of the Sicilian school, except maybe one or two, 
uh, were lost. And what remained was basically uh, what was copied by the uh, Amanuenses uh, from Florence or Siena or even other cities, which is not basically the same as the original because they uh, tran tr actually translated the, the Sicilian and put endings that were wrong. Uh, <laughs> the, they created what we call the Sicilian rhyme, which is basically uh, a rhyme that doesn't rhyme in effect. Uh, uh, and they changed everything. So we don't really know what the Sicilian original was uh, of the Sicilian school. And one of the projects that I started recently was uh, to take one, to take some of the poems written by, say, uh, uh, the founder of the Sicilian uh, uh, the, the the head man of the Sicilian school, uh, who was uh, Giacomo Dalentini, Lentini. Giacomo Dalentini, who invented the sonnet, by the way, uh, um, and I took some of his poems and try to give back, try to work my way back and replace what has been what has been written uh with sicilian a sicilian are obviously cannot be the same sicilian of 1230 of 1230 it's got to because we don't know how uh, there were so many different uh, ramifications and so many different influences in that language and we really don't know how they they did but i retranslated what was already translated into into Tuscan, into Sicilian, changing the end words, changing the words, changing verbs, uh, making it sound more like Sicilian than the Tuscan version of it. I, I published it. I did. I did a Zoom video, a Zoom presentation of it, and I read the poem in different places. Um, Something like that was tried uh, by uh, uh, a famous uh, linguist uh, named Sant'Angelo, but most people say that he didn't do a good job or it's, it's basically impossible to recreate the language of, of the 13th century into I'm modern. I'm sure it Sicilian. must be difficult. But yeah, it's very difficult. And you don't so, know, but basically I, I am convinced that my version of Giacomo Dalentini's poem is closer to the original than what, what the Tuscans did. Very interested in your opinion, okay? There's been a lot of talk since the Roman times, since the Roman times about building a bridge from oh. Messina <laughs> to Reggio Calabria. Uh, yes or no? What's your opinion? Well, as, as you said, since the Roman times, people have been trying to build a bridge. And they haven't done it. So I, what can I say? Uh, they keep saying, there oh, you go. They, they keep spending money on projects. Uh, I basically don't think it will happen because it's the cost is uh, uh, unbelievable. The cost to cross the island from the island to the mainland is also very high. And some people are object to it because basically Sicilians like the idea of being on an island. They love Sicily. They love the idea that they are apart from the mainland. That they, because if you if because one of the one of the basic tenets of Arba Sicula is the idea that Sicilian is the identity of of the Sicilian people. The language is part of the culture, and if you destroy the language, you destroy the culture, and you lose your identity. I wrote uh, one of my last books was uh, this book that I give you. I don't know if you can see it. It's called The Poetry of Ignazio Butita. And Ignazio Butita was a poet of uh, Bagheria near Palermo 
who wrote uh, one beautiful poetry. He was really uh, like, like, like um, a volcano of of uh, Sicilitude, if I can say that. But I one love of the, that uh, volcano. <laughs> one of the poems that he wrote that we published in Alba Sicula in the first issue of the magazine was lingua e dialetto, which begins with you can take you can take everything away from a people. You can take the bed where he sleeps, uh, the table where he eats. Uh, he's still free and he's still rich. But if you take away his language, he becomes poor and enslaved. He is lost for I love that thought. So he is like an icon uh, for Sicilian and for Alba Sicula because of his defense of the Sicilian language and the Sicilian culture. And uh, he, and basically, mm -hmm. I, I've been trying to, to do this book for the last 15 years, and I finally was able to do it. I want to ask you something, and this is going to open up a can of worms, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> the unification. You talk about Sicilians like to be you know, keep to themselves an island language, so forth. The unification. I have heard and spoken to some uh, experts who say it was the start of the demise of the Sicilian economy, uh, of not just Sicilian, but Calabria, the whole southern oh, oh, Italy. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, uh, in your opinion, obviously we can see many positive uh aspects as well for the unification. Garibaldi and his men of a thousand um, red shirts, you know, went through Sicily. They have to convince Sicilians uh, to unify because without Sicily, of course, nothing can happen as we know throughout history. You know, Sicilians were promised certain things. So I, I want to stop there and, and pass it to you. What's your view on this, on the unification? I want you to look at this. You can see it, right? It's, it's, can you read it? It says, the struggle for Sicilian, the struggle for Sicilian independence. I, this is a book that just came out, and this is the back cover of, uh, of the book. It was written by Giuseppe Chanon, and it basically tells the story of, of how Sicily became part of Italy uh, through Garibaldi's invasion of Sicily, and through uh, the different things and, and what what actually happened in Sicily. But it is written from the point of view of Sicilians. It is not written as a geography. In other words, uh, uh, there's a, an official history of Sicily that is written a certain way. Giuseppe Chanel writes it from the point of view of, of the losers, of what they lost, and how the victory of, uh, of Piedmont, of Victor Emmanuel II, Cavour, and the others uh, did. Uh, and basically, I recommend this book, which just came out, just came out. It has been in my hand for the last 20 years. I would recommend people read the, the beginning chapter of the, this book, which tells the story of the differences, uh, the different uh, perceptions that people have of what Sicily and the south of Italy was in 1860. Most people think that the kingdom of the two Sicilies was a backward country, a poor, uh, where people were being famished. Um, uh, and basically, Giuseppe Chanel points out, together with lots of different people, points out that the south, southern part of Italy, the kingdom of the two Sicily was not inferior, in fact, it was superior in many ways to the uh, to the northern uh, uh, regions. Piedmont, Sardinia, uh, Liguria. Uh, just to give you an idea, Sicily for Sicily had a not Sicily, the kingdom of the two Sicily had a gold backed uh, economy. In other words, their wealth was 
in gold. They had gold bullions in the bank. They had gold and silver bullions in the bank. Uh, they had, uh, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, they had uh, not much of a debt, national debt, uh, compared to the North. I'll give you an idea. I give you, I, uh, Sicily had basically five million five million lire debt, national debt, a debt of five million lire. Piedmont, in the same time, had a national debt of fifty eight million. Huh? Gold, the gold reserves of the Sicilian, uh, of uh, Sicilian, and the, I keep saying Sicilian, but it's actually Naples and Sicily. You know, from Naples down, yeah. Molise, the, the whole south of Italy, the gold reserves of the Sicilian and Neapolitan realm was four hundred and forty-four million lire worth. Guess how much uh, all the other regions of Italy uh, had uh, in their national treasury. Altogether, Piedmont, Liguria, Lombardy, Ven Venice, all the others, I think the, altogether they had less than 200 million. And their, wow. their economy was not gold-backed. They had paper money. And the first thing that Garibaldi did when he invaded Sicily and came, took control of Palermo, do you know what it was? Went to the bank. Took the gold. And took the gold. And with that, he, the, the uh, enterprise of the thousand soldiers was financed primarily <laughs> through that through gold. Sicilian gold. Unbelievable. Okay, so basically that answered my question about how you feel about oh, the I, I mean, I'm giving you history. I don't, uh, we're happy to be Italians. I'm happy to be Italian. I, I made course. my living, I made my living basically by teaching Italian. So I am not, uh, to give you, I, I, I wrote down some parts of the, the, of, of the stuff uh, that perhaps I can say. In, uh, say, the people employed in industry, People employed in, there were more people employed in, indus, in industrial work in the South than they were in the North. But when, when uh, uh, Sicily and, and the South became part of Italy, all the investments moved up North. And for, I'll give you an idea, for every dollar collected in taxes from the people, 70% was spent in the North and maybe 30% or even less yeah. was spent in Sicily. So I basically they changed everything. They changed everything. And then, you know, the whole idea that the, nor uh, the Northern Kingdom of, of Piedmont and Sardinia uh, keep saying, oh, we had nothing to do with it. We had nothing <laughs> to do with it. There was Garibaldi. No, that was all done with the knowledge of, of them and with, uh, with the instructions from, from them. And I, this book also speaks about the contributions made by the British Secret Service, by the British yeah. Navy, by the mafia people, uh, the people who, who actually joined many of the Garibaldi's uh, advent, uh, enterprises were the Picciotti of, uh, of the mafia, but also yeah. some people who believe that Sicily also should belong to Italy. But, but in general, in general, this book tells a story of what happened. And it tells a story of the brutalities that were made, were done uh, in Sicily, yeah. not only during the war, but also after the war. It's a history that really should be known because most people do not know that. Most people do not know. First of all, they don't know that Sicily is not became part of Italy only in 1861. They think that Sicily, oh, it's, it's Italy. No, it's not. It wasn't Italy before. It was Italy, yes, but uh, Magna Grecia, Roman Empire, yeah, yeah. the Arabs, the. But they only became Sicilian. Major. Italian only in, in 1861. 1861. And basically, people are, are was, fascinated when I tell them this. 
Yeah, uh, people don't know, uh, don't not know, and somehow it's not important to them to to know. But it is important for Sicilians to know the history. That's why Alba Sicula exists. That's why Sicilian Americans came to America in between after after they uh, they became Italian, because Sicily did not know what emigration was until they became Italian. Sicily was always the land, uh, the dream, the land of their dream. It was the land of the dream for the Greeks, for the Phoenicians, for the Arabs, for yeah. everybody else. They all went there like a magnet. It was like, yeah. like basically America was for everybody else. The United States, the land of the dream, the land of freedom. Sicily was always the point of attraction for the people of the Mediterranean. Yeah. And they knew they became, they knew what immigration was after they became Italians. One million think, uh, and 250 people left Sicily from eight, eight, 1890 to 1925, 30 after the war. A quarter of the Sicilian population left. And most of those people were poor, often illiterate, couldn't speak or write. They only knew Sicilian, and they went all over the place. Argentina, United States, New Orleans. Brazil, Canada. Brazil, and then later, uh, Australia, all over the world. So yeah, they yeah. didn't know what immigration was, but they learned what immigration was after the collapse of the industries of Sicily, the collapse of the economy because of the philosophy, uh, you know, the disease of the grapes, the vineyards. Uh, because of the discovery of, of, uh, of a different way of extracting sulfur from the ground uh, discovered mm. in, in Texas. It was cheaper. It was cheaper to do and get sulfur from Texas than it was from Sicily. And that collapsed the uh, the, the sulfur mine, yeah, which was a good thing. I think a lot of people don't realize that sulfur mining, Sicily had the monopoly and many of the Western industries had mines there. But that's a, that's another one of those, did you know about Sicily? <laughs> did you know that at one point they had the monopoly? And I, I want to ask you a couple yeah, of more they, questions. But it was a bad thing because uh, people were so exploited and uh, they used to send little children, uh, they would actually sell little children to owners of Caruso. mine. It was a dreadful, I am glad that it was over. I'm, I'm glad yeah. that uh, they, they put a stop to it because, because it was a disgraceful, uh, disgraceful abuse of... Uh, Inhumanity, the in, inhumanity of, of man, uh, anyway. Inhumanity, the cancer. I mean, going to places like Monte Doro, and we went to the Sulfur Museum there. I don't know if you knew there was a, there's a very extensive sulfur mining where detailed how many died, what types of diseases they received. And, and, and they, the Caruso, and, and what's so fascinating to me is that a lot of Sicilians don't know about this history. Oh, no, of course it's not. A lot of Sicilians. Let me ask you this. We know what Sicily's assets are. Of course, it's, I, I always say it's an outdoor museum. It's got, you can go from one town to another, be in Greece or be in beautiful Sparoque. And, you know, it's got such a huge number of influences. But there are several problems. That they Sicily, and, and here on our channel, we speak a lot about, you know, about trash, about um, uh, bureaucracy, about those those types of issues. What, in your um, opinion, are some of Sicily's biggest problems facing today? Today, um, I can tell you, I can remember that Sicily had much bigger problems. When, uh, when, when we go back to Sicily on the tour uh, and we see how things have changed in Sicily, I'm, I'm very happy to see it uh, because I remember how things were 40 years ago and how, or maybe 50 years ago, how things were. Uh, Sicily has, has changed, has improved. 
there's still a lot of uh, of uh, unemployment, obviously. That is a big, big problem. But Sicily... And a huge exodus of young people. And people can't find jobs, can't, yeah, so they leave. And they have to go outside. They have to go outside. And that is a, a growing and, and, and a persistent problem that hasn't been solved. Uh, but Sicily, I think, is doing much better now than it did 50 years ago. Sicily has discovered tourism, uh, has discovered tourism, and that will be a way of actually saving the economy of the island. Uh, because Sicily has, as you as you know, because I see that you, you travel all over Sicily uh, in different places, uh, pointing out uh, the various good things that are there. Sicily has everything. Sicily has the best kept temples, Greek temples in the world. Uh, the temples in Sicily uh, rival the ones in, in Greece. And in, uh, also in, in the southern part of Italy, there's beautiful temples. We have uh, different uh, the disasters, for example, the disaster of, of the earthquake of 1693 uh, turned out to be a good thing because Sicily was rebuilt all in a different style, the Baroque style of different the towns. Italian Baroque, like, uh, yeah. Molto, Com, uh, Modica, all the, all the uh, Catania, even Catania. Uh, so the Baroque style, uh, we, Sicily has everything. Ancient history, modern history, uh, art, museums, all over the things. So it, it attracts yeah. where, uh, where, other regions may be known for a certain thing. I don't know. Sicily has everything. Other regions may may be known, for example, for the Renaissance, uh, like 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 Florence, for example, the, the epitome of the Renaissance uh, birth. But there was a Renaissance in Sicily as well, uh, and uh, different things. S S Sicily has everything. And people are beginning to know that. I uh, used to oh, say yeah. that, people had <laughs> the best sec that Sicily is the best kept secret. I think the secret is out now. <laughs> the secret is out. The secret <laughs> is out. And as you know, we also do what we can through our I channel and through our tours, you. promote. Uh, Professor, I certainly appreciate your time. And, you know, there's several other issues that I wanted to bring up, but let's save it for another time. I appreciate your time. Thank you for your service. Really, it is a service to the Sicilian American community that's me, the, all the Sicilians around the world, really. So thank you for your never ending uh, work to promote. Let's hope, let's hope I can keep doing it. <laughs> let's hope so, too. All right, Professor Gaetano Cipolla. Give my best. I will. I will. I certainly will. Grazie mille. Arrivederci. Grande piacere mio. I want to thank again Professor Gaetano Cipolla for his time. Truly a remarkable person and truly I always learn something from him and I hope you did as well. If you watched this long, thank you so much and thank you for supporting this channel. Of course, we have many more videos on, about, in and all over Sicily, and you'll find it on our channel. So thank you, and have a great day. Arrivederci, ti voglio bene.